if you have somebody who is already depressed, put them on suicide watch. Because this show here will enlighten you, but also may terrify you. So the tagline for the Rich Dad Radio Show is the good news and bad news about money. We're going to hold no punches today. It's going to be a lot of bad news about what is really going on. Because if you watch Bubble Vision, CNBC, or Bloomberg, they say, oh, you don't have to worry. The economy, U.S. economy is strong. Our banks are tougher than ever before. We've made the corrections. But the reality is most people are concerned. And today's program is about what is the effect of China. You see, in 2007, when the economy crashed and Lehman Brothers, Bear Stearns, and those guys went down, and we went into this massive, massive crash, much a thousand times bigger than the 1929 crash, China did not crash with us. So the question is today, here in 2016, what happens if China crashes with us? So it's a very important show for yourself, your family, and your businesses, your future. So, Kim, any comments, please? You know, here at the Rich Dad Radio Show, we want to, we don't talk to people that are linked to an agenda like Bubble Vision and their, their advertisers and things like that. We want to find out what's really going on in the world. And so our guest today is a, an economist who lives in Asia. He's born in, the, born in the U.S., but is living in Asia, has been living there for a long time. And so he really does have his finger on the pulse of what's happening in China and Japan and the world economy. So I'm excited to, to, to learn a lot from this gentleman. And he's one of our more popular contributors. He writes for the Rich Dad, uh, Rich Dad Company. He's worked for the IMF as well as the World Bank. And he is the author of a very important book called The Dollar Crisis, The New Depression, and The Corruption of Capitalism. Another fantastic book. So today we're talking to Richard Duncan, a regular contributor to the Rich Dad Radio Show. But again, but you're, if you have somebody with a weak heart, Tell them, don't listen to this program. Well, I do want to say we are also going to talk about some of the things that you can do to prepare and to be in a position so you don't have to go on suicide watch because there are things you can do. Yeah, take the roach potion away, okay? So anyway, <laughs> welcome to the program, Richard. Hi, Kim. Hi, Robert. Hi, Richard. Thanks be for here. being on. And thanks for being on this program uh, from Thailand. It's my pleasure. Yeah, before, before we get into what causes this dollar crisis, what the heck is the stuff you're talking about now? Death spirals. Right? You, want, you want to terrify every, everybody out there? <laughs> it's a really exciting time in the markets. This year is off to a really frightening start. The strategy team at, at Citigroup came out with a report in which they, they argued that the world economy is trapped in a death spiral. <laughs> That's and good. this made headlines all around the world. And what, what does that mean, a death spiral? That sounds, pretty, that sounds pretty, pretty negative. It certainly is pretty negative. And their, their death spiral went something like this. The global economy is weak, so everyone wants to buy dollars. So the, strong, the dollar gets stronger, and that hurts the commodity prices. That causes commodity prices to go down. So the commodity-producing countries their economies get into trouble and they are unable to repay their bank loans and they also import less from the rest of the world. So the global economy gets even weaker and people buy even more dollars and the dollar strengthens further and the commodity prices fall further. And so it goes down and down in a vicious spiral. So commodity countries, the big ones that we know of, are countries like Canada, Australia, Brazil. Is that correct? Yes, but of course, you know, a lot of smaller countries as well. Right. Malaysia, Indonesia, Thailand, a lot, most Africa, most of South America. I would argue that, okay, cities right, their analysis is right, but it's not just one death spiral. I really think that there are, are numerous death spirals that are overlapping and mutually reinforcing. For example, three others. We've got the China hard landing death spiral, the asset price bubble deflating death spiral, and the credit death spiral. They're all, they're all in play. So, Richard, when you talk about asset prices, what kind of assets are you talking about? First and foremost, the stock market, but also the property market. Right. And – Commodity prices. Well, let me ask you about China because um, the, didn't the government just come out recently and say, oh, don't worry, we're going to stabilize our economy and we're going to have this 
8% growth, then we're going to take care of it. Yeah, can you imagine uh, the Chinese government guaranteeing, <laughs> guaranteeing a stabilized... It. They guaranteed it. Chinese government guarantees a stable government. They must have President uh, Obama as their president. So, yeah, so what's that all about? Well, they would like to, but it's much easier to say that they're going to stabilize the economy than actually to achieve that. What we see happening in China now is quite similar to what happened in Japan in the 1980s and then later in the 1990s to all the Asia crisis countries like Thailand, Malaysia, and Singapore. This was something that I wrote about in my book, The Dollar Crisis, which came out in 2003. And the theme of the dollar crisis was that the United States trade deficit, the United States started having a very large trade deficit for the first time in the 1980s. That meant, that meant, we, were, that meant we were importing more than we were exporting. That's right. And the countries that we imported from, like Japan in the 70s and 80s, they had a very big trade surplus. So that meant that a lot of dollars went into Japan and they went into the Japanese banks and they, they caused the deposits to grow rapidly. So that forced the banks to make their loan book grow rapidly. And the rapid credit expansion blew Japan's economy into a bubble. And that bubble popped in 1990. And the same thing happened in the Asia crisis countries during the 1990s, Thailand, Malaysia, Indonesia, Korea. And exactly the same thing has happened in China now. China has such a large trade surplus with the United States. Last year, it was $340 billion last year alone. So all of these foreign dollars have gone into China's economy now for the last couple of decades, and they've blown China into just this incredible economic bubble. They have excess capacity across absolutely every industry on a scale mankind has never witnessed before. And so there's no point in China continuing to build more industrial capacity. There's no point in building one more steel mill because China probably already has three times more steel than the whole world can afford to consume. And it's not just steel, but it's all across every industry you can imagine. Okay, well, okay, so, and, Richard, so this is what you wrote. You wrote about in Dollar Crisis 2003. And this is one of the reasons you've been my friend for all these years, because you've been warning us all of this time. So once again, this is Richard Duncan. He is the author of the book, The Dollar Crisis, the first book of Richard's I read. He's been warning us for years. And now it's come home to roost because China has been in a bubble now for about 30 years. And we have imported, you know, all you Walmart shoppers and Kmart shoppers, all of that money you shipped over to China blew their economy into this huge bubble. So that meant the Chinese had all this money sitting there, and now it's going to come down upon us. So, Richard, explain something to the layperson like me. If we buy too much, let's say we shop at Walmart too much, and all this money sits in China, how does that affect China? What happens then? It affects China, and it also comes back into the United States and affects the United States. Yes, but what? So, what the, this, so the Chinese get all these U.S. dollars. Let's say, let's say a hundred U.S. dollars. What do they do with it then? Okay, so the Chinese manufacturers who sell their goods in the United States, they get paid in dollars and they take all of these dollars back home to china last year it was 340 billion u.s dollars now they would like to convert these dollars into the local currency into the renminbi but if they converted 340 billion dollars into renminbi the renminbi would probably quadruple in value and that would kill China's exports because China would no longer be competitive. Because the because of, would collapse. Right, because this is the part that renminbi becomes too valuable, too expensive. That would make China's exports too expensive. And if their ex exports got too expensive, their economy would collapse anyway. That's right. They're, they're, they couldn't, China's economy couldn't withstand a very – sharply appreciated currency. So they don't so want the, they don't want the dollars converted to renminbi. So what do they do with the dollars then? What happens is they allow these Chinese manufacturers who have the dollars, they allow them to convert them into renminbi. But here's the thing. The central bank 
buys all of the dollars coming into China at a fixed exchange rate, so they don't let the, pre the currency appreciate. They manipulate it. The central bank, the People's Bank of China, they buy all of the dollars coming into China at a fixed exchange rate. So whoever brings the dollars in, they get to convert their money into renminbi and do anything they want with it. But pretty soon, it ends up in the Chinese banks as deposits. So there's very rapid deposit growth. And that forces the banks then to lend out all of those deposits. Therefore, there's very rapid credit growth. And the very rapid credit growth, we're talking 20 or 30 percent credit growth a year, that this was going on for a couple of decades. This very rapid credit growth leads to an expansion of industrial capacity. All the companies borrow money, they build more factories, they build skyscrapers, they invest in everything imaginable until there's so much overinvestment that none of them can turn a profit. But meanwhile, the central bank, you have to understand, where did the central bank get the money to buy all of the dollars, the $340 billion last year and the year before? Well, the central bank is, is like the Fed. They can print money from thin air, and that's what they did. So the central bank of China printed $340 billion worth of renminbi from thin air, and they bought these $340 billion. And once the central bank had the $340 billion, they had to do something with it. And what they did with it was buy US dollar denominated assets. They had dollars, so they bought treasury bonds or some other US dollar denominated corporate bond or maybe even some stocks. And so that money came flooding back into the US, not just last year alone. So this started, this started two decades ago. Right. And you may want to listen to this again, or you have a friend or family member who needs to wake up and smell the coffee about what's happening with China and the world economy. Our guest today is Richard Duncan, been a friend for years. In 2003, he wrote The Dollar Crisis, and The Dollar Crisis explained why the world is so screwed up, why we have these booms and these busts. And you know, everybody thinks it's the Democrats and the Republicans and the central banks. It's really a lot more complex than that. And also, if I'm going to plug myself, I wrote a long, a long, long time ago, Rich Dad's prophecy. I said in 2016, the world economy would collapse. And here we are on target, on schedule, starting in January. The whole thing started to come down. So for those of you who are wondering about your 401k, your job, or whether you should still shop at Walmart, this is really your, your program. We'll do our best to keep it as simple as possible. But ladies and gentlemen, we're in serious financial trouble. You know, I don't think it makes a difference if my friend Donald Trump gets elected or Bernie Sanders. I don't think it's going to make an ounce of difference because this time China is coming down with us. China did not come down the last election in 2008. But China's coming down during this election. Any comments, Kim? Well, I'd like to that, – that's a great lead-in for our, our guest, Richard Duncan, who's author and economist. He lives in Thailand, which is great because we get a, a Asia perspective from somebody that, that is there seeing it happen and unfold right before his eyes. Okay, so, so Richard, with China's turmoil and all that's happening in the China economy, um, imports slowing, how does that affect the world and how does that affect the U.S.? What really matters for the rest of the world – is not how much China's economy is growing. What matters is how much China's imports are growing. As long as China is importing more and more from the rest of the world every year, then China acts like a driver of global economic growth. And is China it allows are, other countries are, are export China's, more to China? Are China's imports growing? Well, so that's the thing. China's imports have stopped growing. Last year, China's imports actually contracted by 10%. So China is no longer acting as a driver of global growth. China is buying less from the rest of the world. And consequently, commodity prices are crashing. Because China is buying less, commodity prices are falling very sharply. And this is causing damage all around the world. It's hurting the emerging market economies that produce commodities like Canada and Australia Malaysia, Indonesia, Brazil, and Africa. But in addition to that, it's not only hurting those economies, making them weaker and making them less able to import from the rest of the world, but it's also damaging 
all of the global corporations that produce commodities so, or so are involved if, in metals and mining, oil and gas, or commodities trading. And even so if profit and even if I have, I mean, if, if I have a business, if I have a business and I'm selling my goods or services to China, and I have a business here in the U.S., then I'm going to be affected too. So, so businesses overall could take a a, a bigger hit as well, right? That's right. And not only businesses selling directly to China, but businesses selling to Brazil, because Brazil's gone into recession, because China's buying fewer goods from Brazil than it did in the past. So the, there is a China death spiral, if you will, because China's importing less, commodity prices are crashing, and that's hitting the emerging market economies. It's also hitting the global stock market. That means there's less wealth and therefore less consumption. And this drags the global economy down again. One more rung in the death spiral. So once again, it's Robert Kiyosaki. We're talking to Richard Duncan. I know this may be overwhelming for you. Some of you called, you know, death spirals in China and imports and exports. And you know, all, all most people are concerned, concerned about you know, what's the prices at Walmart next week? You know, can, can I get a discount at my local grocery store? But for those of you who are concerned, Richard Duncan has been warning of this for years. That's why his book, The Dollar Crisis 2003, The New Depression 2012, and The Corruption of Capitalism 2011 are vital reads. Now, for those of you who may not want to read, Richard has Macro Watch with his video newsletter, and we subscribe to it. And the reason we subscribe to it is because rather than just talking words, Richard is talking in pictures, in graphs. He will show you what's happening to the economies of the world, the country you may live in, and the U.S. So the coupon code is RICHDAD. It's one word, R-I-C-H-D-A-D, and it's a 50% discount. His website is Richard Duncan economics.com Richard Duncan economics.com all one word so if this is kind of going over your head the reason I interrupted this this is important I think we're going down as I said I predicted in 2016 the world economy would collapse I'm on time on schedule and Rich is going to back it up with actual charts and graph because he is an economist he worked with the IMF and the World Bank so for those of you who are concerned about you, your family, and your financial future, Richard Duncan is your guy to listen to because he may give you at least a 30-day head start on what's about to happen. And, and with all of our guests, um, we don't endorse uh, their products. We don't endorse Macro Watch, but we do our best to offer you resources so that you can decide for yourself what you want to listen to. And the reason Macro Watch is important is because most, uh, at least for me, most of the guys are talking about the U.S. economy, and Richard is talking about what's happening in the world. Hey, Richard, going back to a little, more, a little bit more simpler question, okay? Are you buying bonds or gold? <laughs> <laughs> I I don't own any bonds, but I I certainly do own some gold. Well, is I it think, is it true that Asians like gold? Because you know when when you and I were touring through Asia, not that long ago, there was thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of little shops all selling gold, right? Yes, that's right. Uh, yeah, the so, Asians do like to own gold uh, all across Asia from from India to China and and across Southeast Asia. Do you know why? Their history is always, they have many examples in the past where paper money has become worthless right. due if, to high rates of inflation. Right. For those who so may, may not know this, the first paper money was from China. But the Asians like gold, and that's why a lot of people are now saying it might be time to look at gold. What do you have to say about that? Well, I think it is a, a very interesting time to look at gold for a couple of reasons. One, now the central banks in Europe and in Japan are actually charging negative interest rates. Yes. If, in other words, if, you want, if you're a bank and you want to deposit money at the central bank in Europe or Japan, you have to pay them. They don't pay you interest. And that's, and, why, and that's why at Rich Dad we always said savers were losers, and now it's true. All you savers out there, stop saving money and do something else. <laughs> Buy bonds. <laughs> and, in, and in congressional testimony just a couple of weeks ago, Janet Yellen said it's not out of the question that 
the U.S. central bank will begin charging negative interest rates. No. So if, if you're going to be charged to deposit your money, why would anybody deposit their money and have to pay for the deposit when you could buy gold? So At least you don't have to pay anyone to own gold. Well, that's, that's not that. It's, doesn't a negative interest rate kind of tell you they printed too much money? Is that Am I being too oversimplistic? There's too much money. They don't want it. That's right. There's, they've printed too much money globally. So there's more money out circulating in the world than there are opportunities to absorb that money in, in profitable investment opportunities. Well, that's, that's so because... That's because people aren't borrowing it, which is one of your death spirals, which is credit, right? The credit spiral. If people stop borrowing reason, money, they don't need the banks don't need your savings. Is that correct? That's right. We've got to the point now where we have two problems. The, the banks don't want to lend money to people because the people already have too much debt. They can't repay the debt they have already. And at the same time, the people don't want to borrow the money because they don't see anywhere they could invest the money and make a profit, enough profit to repay the money. So this is what this is what we are experiencing due to decades of too much credit growth and too much paper money creation around the world. So what would you so is that your credit's death spiral? Is that what you're talking about? Well the credit death spiral goes like this. In in the United States Anytime credit grows by less than 2%, now this is adjusted for inflation. But going back to 1952, there have been only nine times when total credit grew by less than 2%. Every time that happened, the U.S. went into a recession. And the recession didn't end until we had another big surge of credit expansion. So right now, credit is not growing by 2% in the United States. So the U.S. economy is moving back toward recession. The U.S. is importing less. That's another reason commodity prices are falling. And so with commodity prices falling, the rest of the world is going into recession. And they're importing less from the United States. So the United States is getting weaker and on and on. And as these emerging market economies get weaker, then they can't repay their bank loans. And as the commodity producing metal and mining corporations, oil and gas corporations, and commodity trading corporations, as their profits plummet and turn to losses, they can't repay their bank loans. As I said, I wrote a book called Rich Dad's Prophecy, and I said the biggest crash in history was coming in 2016. And when Happy New Year came, 2016, the market started plunging. We've lost trillions of dollars in so-called wealth. It's all imaginary anyway because the stock market goes down. But anyway, our discussion today is what happens when China goes down. And we've never been here before. Never in the history of the world has it been possible for one time the whole world to go down together. Like the last crash in 2007 and 2008, basically only the U.S. went down. But this time, if China comes down, it's aloha, as they say. So our guest today is Richard Dunk. He's been a friend of Rich Dad for a long time. He is a Rich Dad. He, does, he writes a blog for Rich Dad. He's the author of The Dollar Crisis, which came out in 2003, explaining how the U.S. dollar and too much money floats all around the world, calling bubbles, like the Japanese bubble, the, the Malaysian bubble, and now the Chinese bubble, and why it's going to collapse and also, he's the author of The New Depression, The Corruption of Capitalism. And I strongly suggest you subscribe to his video newsletter, MacroWatch. And the reason it's a video newsletter is because you can read the charts and graphs, and you can see what's about to hit us. Because if you are forewarned, you have a better chance of protecting whatever you have. Any comments? And, well, you know, it's funny because it wasn't that long ago. I think it was around 2008 or so when everybody was saying China is going to be the next major power force in the, US, in, the, in the world and they're going to take over and their currency is going to be the next reserve currency. And that wasn't that long ago. That was only like 2008. And now the whole thing is crashing down around us. It's, it's quite shocking. Quite shocking. So, Richard, are you concerned about the? You know, we are in. I think we're in a recession right now. Anyway, they're not saying it. But what do you think the chances now of a depression? You know, let's say out of a 
50 50, 80 what's, 20? Yeah, what's your crystal ball say? Okay, well, my crystal ball says it, it, that it all depends on what the government does next. What everyone needs to understand is that we don't have a capitalist economy. The government has been managing our economy really since World War II. Uh, when World War II started, government spending increased by 900 percent, and that ended the Depression. But they've never been able to wean the economy off its dependence on the government since then. Now, most of the time, it's, it's not so obvious. But starting in 2008 and 9, when the U.S. economy collapsed, it came very close to collapsing into a depression then. And at that point, the government had to respond with massive fiscal budget deficit stimulus and also massive paper money creation stimulus, quantitative easing. And that's how they've managed to keep our global bubble inflated. So that's Bernie, why we haven't had a depression. So Bernie Sanders being a socialist is a little ahead of his at times. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> <laughs> oh, please. There are three ways out of this death spiral crisis. The first way out is death, followed by hell because we would have decades of misery and poverty and most probably war. So that's the worst option. The second way out of this death spiral crisis is to have a fourth round of quantitative easing, QE4 on a very big scale. But wouldn't, wouldn't, that, just, way, wouldn't, wouldn't that just push the problem down the road? Wouldn't it we eventually have to meet its maker at some point? Well, isn't that what life is all about? <laughs> I mean, look at life itself you know the whole idea is to die some other time and not today and yeah, let your kids pay for let, it yeah <laughs> okay what's the third option richard the third option is fiscal stimulus on a very large scale in other words larger budget deficits what, what does and that mean actually that means the government should borrow and spend more. And in, in other words, so instead of quantitative easing, where the central bank just prints more money and pushes interest rates lower and lower and creates an even bigger stock market bubble and more and more income inequality, okay, that would work for a short time. That would reflate the global bubble for a few more years, but then it would deflate again just like it did after the end of QE1 and after the end of QE2, and now it's deflating again after the end of QE3. The same thing would happen after QE4. But the, the best way out of this death spiral crisis would be for the U.S. government to borrow and spend more. And spend but, on what? But, well, there we, again, there are options on how they could spend. They, there are three, three broad options. They could have a war. That's the traditional way of getting out of economic problems. But, of course, that comes with a lot of very negative side effects. Or they could cut taxes. That would, that would stimulate the economy for a while, but it would also exacerbate the income inequality in the country, and that would threaten democracy. And the third option would be that they could actually borrow the money and invest it in new industries and technologies, the way that they borrowed in order to send a man to the moon through NASA. They could invest on a very large scale in new industries and new technologies. They could invest in genetic engineering, biotech, nanotech, green energies. And in that way, they could restructure the economy and spend our way out of this crisis and restructure the economy and create new jobs, new skills, new exports. And we would never have to collapse into a depression. So are you, they follow that strategy. Doesn't that border on what Bernie Sanders wants to do? It's not really entirely clear what Bernie Sanders wants to do. <laughs> he wants to give everybody a free education. The trouble everybody. is they can't read and write. That's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> well, it must, it, it, Richard, it I must like, be interesting being an American, living in northern Thailand, watching the circus, you know, with Tina Fey and Sarah Palin and Donald and... Hillary, it must be kind of interesting, isn't it? Well, my, my foreign friends, not only the Thais, but all the other expats from England, France, Canada, etc., they are certainly having a fun time <laughs> teasing me about the American elections. Uh, but it is a very serious matter. 
But and one of the reasons that it is so serious is because the election is not even happening until November. Yep. So we're in gridlock between now and November. Well, don't if you we think Barack have... Obama is going to save us? <laughs> well, you know, I think he would give it a good shot, but <laughs> he doesn't control the Congress and Congress passes the laws. So in order to have any more government borrowing and spending, that would be something that Congress would have to decide to do. And the Congress is now controlled by the Republicans. And the Republicans, I believe, feel that the worse the economy is this year, the better they will have a chance of electing a Republican president in November. So, so they're not going to do anything to stimulate the economy until, well, at least the election. And if they lose, who knows what will happen after that if they, win the, if they lose the presidency. Well, once again, so Robert really Kiyosaki, in- the Rich Dad Radio Show, the good news and bad news about money. Today, our guest is Richard Duncan. He's the author of The Dollar Crisis, also The New Depression and the Corruption of Capitalism. He's been a guest. He writes for the Rich Dad, Rich Dad Company. But he also has a valuable new service. It's called Macro Watch. It's a video newsletter. And the reason that's important, I'll say it again, is because what Richard does, he puts the economy into pictures, into charts and graphs. And that way, you can watch and see what's happening as Richard explained what's happening throughout the world in living color in video and if you you use a coupon code rich dad all one word you get a 50 percent discount his w- website is richard duncan economics.com and the reason i recommend we don't endorse or anything we recommend is that it may give you a few months running head start before the collapse comes and i think it's coming I've been saying this for a long time because Richard's a little bit more optimistic than I am. He actually thinks the government can do something about it. My opinion is, given that it is a global economic crisis and America is a very weakened, wounded duck right now, I don't think any president can save the U.S. from what's about to happen. Any comments? Kim? Well, and if that is the case, because I, I like your option three, Richard, about you got to spend it on things that are important. But I don't know that our politicians know how to, anything much about well, business and it. where to put it and how to how to fix how to how to put industry money into industries like that. I don't know, um, but I do that. That makes sense. Uh, but here's my other question: is so so all of this that's happening. You know, what do, what do our listeners do? What is some advice you can give them? Because you talked about, you know, with the negative savings rate or zero savings rate, maybe it's better to go to gold. Don't than, save money. Than, <laughs> than put it in the bank. What what else do you see that, that people can do, Richard? Different individuals have different amounts of money to invest. And the strategy has to be different for individuals depending on the amount of money they're investing in their own personal circumstances. But I think the most important, To start with, the most important thing for investors is to understand forces that are driving the global economy and to understand that it's really the government now that is driving most of the investments that they have an option of investing in. So individuals, they can buy stocks, they can buy property, they can buy gold, they can buy commodities. All of these asset classes are impacted and their direction is determined by what the government is going to do, what the government's doing and what the government's going to do next. So in my video newsletter, Macro Watch, I, I focus on attempting to anticipate what the government's going to do next. So for instance, because Congress is in gridlock and is incapable of making decisions about how to drive the economy or what to do about the economy, since 2009, it's been the Fed, the central bank, that has been driving the economy by printing money and pushing up asset prices, quantitative easing. They've done this three times. And every time they print the money, then all the asset prices go up. But every time they stop printing the money, all the asset prices go down and the economy gets weak again. So back in 2013, the Fed printed $1 trillion and pumped it into the financial markets. That year, the stock market went up 30%. 2014, they only, only printed $500 billion and the stock market went up 11%. 2015, 
Last year, they didn't print any money at all, and the stock market didn't go up at all. And, it, and now the stock market is starting to drop again quite sharply. So it's very important to try to anticipate what the Fed is going to do next. I believe that they've recently started increasing interest rates. I think they're going to have to backpedal now. Janet Yellen's going to have to cut interest rates. And after that, I think she's going to have to launch a fourth round of quantitative easing. And this is very important for all of the investors to, to be focused on. Because it, when Janet Yellen approaches the microphone and <laughs> begins to say the QE, then this, all the asset prices are going to go up again. So one simple rule of thumb is this. When the central bank is printing a lot of money, that's the time when asset prices like stocks are going to go up. And when the Fed stops printing money, the way they did now about 16 months ago, that's the time to take your profits and wait for a correction in, in stock prices, which we're seeing now. So stay out of the stock for the time being and wait for the Fed to begin printing again. And when they start printing again, then the stocks will go back up again. So that's that's one rule of thumb that I can share with investors. Well, that's Thank that's you. great advice. But yeah. once again, it's Robert Kiyosaki, the Rich Dad Radio Show. We make no recommendations. You know, invest at your own risk. I, I like what Richard is saying, but you still have to make up your own mind. So once again, Richard Duncan, his books are The Dollar Crisis, The New Depression, The Corruption of Capitalism. Please subscribe to his video newsletter, Macro Watch, because that's how you stay ahead of the crash. And you can order it from his website, richardduncaneconomics.com, add coupon code RICHDAD, and all one word, and you get a 50% discount. And what's the first question, Melissa? Our first question today comes from John in Vancouver, British Columbia. Favorite book, Cash Flow Quadrant, says this, Japan's interest rates just went negative. What kind of effects on assets could we see if America was to do the same, and how long can they continue to carry on that experiment? That's a fabulous question, and I think you'd better subscribe to a macro watch because we have never, never, never been here before. How in the world can you take a savers, a person's savings and charge them money to keep the money? So that's a fabulous question because I really don't have the answer. To me, it's great news because I like to borrow money. But if you're a saver, you're the biggest effing loser possible right now. And, you know, um, here's, here's why I love this program. This is why you should listen to this program again and again is because six months ago we had Bert Doman, who's also a uh, regular contributor, regular contributor, stock trader, very brilliant man. Six months ago he was saying the U.S. is heading towards negative interest rates. Other countries are going to be having negative interest rates. Six months ago he said this. So listen to this program because we have some great experts who really are predicting the future based on their knowledge and their expertise. Especially if you have some really stupid people around you who are still telling people to save money. You have got to be crazy to save money today. You have got to be nuts. And once again, we don't endorse Macro Watch as the Bible. We're just saying he gives his opinion. This is what's happening. And ladies and gentlemen, things are changing moment by moment today. What's good today may not be good tomorrow. And, and you know what I like about Richard? Richard actually, Richard Duncan, he does have a different point of view than a lot of people that we bring on. And he really is watching what government is doing. And his thing is about what's going to, the government is the one controlling a lot of the money system. So it's a different point of view. And that's what we want to provide to you. Yeah. All you savers out there, listen to this program again, because you're losers. You're the biggest losers going. If your mother and father tell you to save money and you're going long the stock market, that means investing for the long term, you're losing right now. You better change your thinking. Next question, Melissa. Our next question comes from Joe in Norway. Favorite book, Unfair Advantage. It says, how do you think the coming crash will affect the banks? I've been saving money for two years in a special account just for investments. But what's the use if my bank goes bankrupt and I lose all my money? That's a good question. That's a very good question, especially living in Norway, because Norway's economy, as you know, is dependent upon oil. And the same as Russia's and uh, a lot of oil-producing countries. So I would be very cautious of that because, as Richard Duncan says, many oil companies won't be able to pay their bills. They won't buy, pay off their loans. So I would be very, very careful and find another place to hide some money outside the banking system. And, and you know, don't forget, remember um, not too long ago there was a country called Cyprus, and they did not the bailout, but they did the bail-in. And they basically, instead of... Took the savers' money. They took the savers' money right out of the banks. Yeah. And so if that happened in Cyprus, could that happen here? 
It's called, you know, Kim and I don't keep all of our money in banks. We have them hidden in other places that are safer than banks. But I don't trust my bank either. Next question, Melissa. Our next question comes from Dan in Texas. Favorite book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. He says, what the banks are doing to bail out Wall Street, aren't you also doing with your investing? Amen, brother. That's really the name of the game. Rich Dad is about what the rich are doing with their money. Now, you have a choice. You can do what the middle class is doing, which is saving money and investing for the long term of the stock market. Or you can do what the poor are doing, which is you know just basically doing your best to pay your bills. But there's another game called what the rich are doing. So, look, listen to this. We buy a lot of real estate using debt. If that debt, let's say it's $100 million, goes bad, we just give it back to the bank. But if you lose your house, you go on the streets. So you've got to know the difference between personal investing and investing outside of personal. So Kim and I, if things go bad, we still have a roof over our head. If other people use their house as an ATM, for example, which is one stupid, stupid thing the middle class does, then you are on the streets. So you better know the difference between what the poor, middle class, and rich are doing. And Rich Dad Radio is about what the rich are doing, not the middle class and poor. Melissa, next. One, one, oh. one more thing on bankruptcy. You know, everybody's attacking my friend Trump for being, going bankrupt four times. Well, those were business bankruptcies. They're not personal bankruptcies. And there's a very big difference between personal bankruptcies and business bankruptcy. Kim and I have one business bankruptcy, but we have no personal bankruptcies. And if you don't know the difference to that, you better reread Rich Dad Poor Dad again, because there's a very big difference. The, the rich are not stupid enough to let the government or the banks take our, our homes and our businesses. But that's why for those of you who want to know what the rich are doing, just stay tuned to Rich Dad Radio Show. Yes, we do what the rich do. If they bail the rich out, they'll bail us out too. That's a good policy. Next question, Melissa. Our next question comes from Adam in Ontario. Favorite book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. It says, how much more debt do you think the United States can handle until their dollar becomes worthless? That's a great question. I don't think anybody knows. Rich Duncan estimates is 250% of GDP. Right now we're at 120% GDP. So it's everybody's guess. They can keep using debt as long as we accept the dollar. Any comments, Kim? Well, and as Richard said, you know, we might go into QE4 and printing more money. Um, so we've never been here before. I mean, we've never been here before. So it's a, it's a good question. And I just find it interesting right now that the U.S. dollar is so strong, given all that the other currencies are less strong. Not that the U.S. is so strong, but we're the least of the worst. And this is the big point here. The world has been here before, but not as a world. You see, back in the 1918, 1923, Germany did the same thing. They printed money, and the German economy went into crisis. But this time, it's the world going into crisis. So there's a very big difference. So the U.S. dollar was strong, just as the Reichsmark back in 1918, 1923 was strong. But the people who held on to the Reichsmark lost everything. So anybody who's holding on to paper currency, like the dollar, the renminbi, the yuan, the yen, the peso, the euro, you're in trouble today. That's why we have this program. It's not about which currency is stronger. It's which which currency will survive. And we have never been here on a global basis before. So that's why personally Kim and I have gold because 20 years from now, gold will still be here, but the U.S. dollar may not. Gold will still be here in 20 years, but the euro may not. So I I don't know if you want to play that game, but I'd rather have gold than try to guess which which currency will survive. Which which currency is stronger now may change tomorrow. Next question. Our next question comes from Al in San Antonio. Favorite book, Rich Dad Guide to Investing. It says, Robert, since all fiat currencies eventually go to zero, do you think all debt will be wiped out, or do you believe the Federal Reserve has one last trick up their sleeve? The answer is yes, 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 yes. I, I'm kind of hoping that the dollar goes bankrupt because then I'm going to pay, we're going to, Kim and I are going to pay off all our debt, <laughs> our hundreds of millions of dollars of debt with play money. Just remember this from the game of Monopoly. It says that right in the game of Monopoly, if the bank runs out of money, the bank simply creates more money by writing on blank sheets of paper. Read the rules of Monopoly. And I'm kind of, you know, I've been playing Monopoly since I was a kid. And I'm kind of hoping that the governments of the world just start saying, here, here's a piece of typing paper, write down how much you want it to be. And when that happens, it's 
It's going to be chaos, but some people will get extremely rich. The debtors will get rich. The savers will get wiped out. That's the difference. If the government says you can just write on a piece of typing paper, I this, pa this paper, piece of paper is $25 million, debtors win, savers lose. Any comments, Kim? Well, I think it's interesting. He asked, does the Federal Reserve have one last trick up their sleeve? Because that a lot a of the, trick. yeah, it, there's a lot of tricks out there. And I think if we, in all these articles that, that we read and people that we talk to, it doesn't seem like the Federal Reserve really know. It's like a big experiment. They keep experimenting. They try this and they try that. And they We've try never this been and they here try before. that. I know. They've never been here before. As a world. Right. I just think it's interesting that they, they're just. It's an experiment. I mean, I really feel that's what the Federal Reserve is doing right now. Just play Monopoly, subscribe to Macro Watch, Richard Duncan, and Janet Yellen says QE6, buy stocks. I mean, really, that's about the best advice you can go today. And if she says QE6 is over, sell stocks. I mean, until people stop playing that game. 